Uh, so we just came through a pretty extensive master planning process. Uh, so our comprehensive uh, plan, Play Zebulon, um, really helped us take a firm look at our um, services offered by here uh, in Zebulon, as well as around us, the services that are offered uh, and within our community, and um, talked about how that's going to look and be shaped moving forward over the next 10 years. Um, so as you know, we operate parks, facilities, and amenities for recreational purposes. We have six parks. Uh, we maintain the Greenway Trails. We also have a community center. Uh, we offer a variety of programs, uh, and that includes anything from events to athletics, nature programs, cultural programs, and more. Um, one thing that is, um, came, it, it became pretty obvious throughout the process, things we already knew, um, but the town of Zebulon is the primary recreation provider in our community. Uh, there are some other providers. There are, um, you have some select uh, baseball teams uh, or travel-like teams. You do have um, a recreational football team uh, that is done um, through a private means. Uh, there are a couple other areas, um, but primarily we do offer um, the recreational services in our community. And some of your larger communities, you have a YMCA, you have churches, you have a couple of other um, different avenues that provide um, recreational experiences. And um, like I said, with the exception of some of those smaller groups and even the Boys and Girls Club, um, we, we don't have as many of those options. Uh, and what we heard throughout the Play Zebulon process is that we really want our community to be a community where people are, we don't want that bedroom community. So we want a community where people can live, work, and play. Um, and so we've heard a lot about we want our department to plan things and operate in a manner that keeps people in Zebulon um, so that they're not having to go to other communities uh, to get some of the recreational services that they're looking for. Um, and as you've heard um, before and even this evening uh, or this afternoon, uh, everything that we do as a department comes back to the town's strategic plan, uh, comes back to the vision of that strategic plan and your focus areas of a vibrant downtown, small town life, and growing smart. And the vision for um, the Parks and Rec Department that was identified through um, the Play Zebulon plan uh, was derived by a combination of the strategic plan as well as heavy community input. And uh, so just, I always love to really focus on what that vision is um, because it, it tells a wonderful story about where we're headed. Uh, to create recreational and cultural opportunities that enhance quality of life and connect our residents through positive impacts on health and wellness, social interaction, economic growth, and environmental stewardship. And uh, you saw this slide uh, back in December at our work session. And I think it's just an excellent representation of how the goals that you adopted in the master plan directly tie into um, your strategic plan. And um, just about, well, not just about, but um, all of your vision goals for the master plan do hit at least one um, of your strategic plan goals. Most of them hit two, if not three. So that leads us to the assignment today, and that's to talk about um, just kind of that assessment of how recreation is fitting into this rapidly growing town and how we'll be able to serve that town of 18,000 people. And as we look at the two specific areas of capacity and capability, when we're talking about capacity, we're looking at some increases. When we're talking about uh, or of volume and area, just um, things that are happening very naturally. When we're looking at capability, those are things and how we're responding and how we can respond. Traditional systems versus how we need to transition. Um, I, would, I think this board should be commended because uh, our department has been working on this transition since 2020. Uh, when we started the master planning process, we did do an organizational assessment of our department and a staffing assessment. 
Uh, and so with that process, we began to reframe and reorganize the Parks and Rec Department. So some of these things we've been working towards and we're gonna continue to work towards. So some things you've already started to see uh, because we got a little bit of a head start uh, through that master planning process back in 2020. Um, in addition, we have been working through that process to train ourselves as staff uh, as well as work with our Parks and Rec Advisory Board in a different format. And all of those things help us to lead into the discussions tonight. So for our capacity review, there are a couple of things that are really making an impact on how we are gonna operate and serve our community. Um, one of the items is expanding acreage with our greenway. I'm gonna give the example of for one and a half miles of greenway that are installed, it really equates to a couple acres of um, linear park. Uh, so we are fortunate that we have a UDO that requires um, our developers to build um, these greenway segments that are identified in your plan. Uh, at the end of the day, having that infrastructure there is great, but we still have to maintain it. Uh, so just keeping that in mind as this rapid growth occurs, we are also, um, just like with the streets that come, we're also getting the greenway and that linear park that comes with it. Um, there's also been a transfer of acreage. So um, we, not just our department, but as you hear, all of our departments are having to operate different and we're all seeing growth in different capacities and demands on the departments. Um, prior to getting here, um, or taking this position as Zebulon, uh, our department parks um, were managed in two different capacities. Some of them were managed um, strictly by the Parks and Rec Department. Some of them were being maintained on a landscape level by Public Works. And what we were having were two different levels of service being provided at those properties. Um, it was great for efficiencies in past years, but it really isn't the best um, for our community as far as having a park system that is equitable across the board. Um, there's also been an increased use of a park system. So when I um, returned to Zebulon in 2018, we were a town of um, 6,500 people. Today, in 2022, we are a town of over 8,300. That's a very rapid growth for a small town. Um, that is an increased use on your park system. That is something that our master plan addressed and you adopted a recreation impact fee already to help address that impacted use, but there's still the day-to-day -day operational things that that recreation impact fee is not gonna necessarily address. That'll focus on the capital improvements. Um, there's also an increase, well, I'm gonna go back. The increase in use of our park system. Um, I've, I think it's important to note that across the nation and really across the world, but across the United States specifically, um, park systems saw a dramatic increase in use following the COVID pandemic. Um, so in addition to the growth that our community is having, the use of individuals on a regular basis has increased on park systems. Um, there's also an increased exposure. Um, as our community grows, there's more eyes on our park systems. There's more eyes on um, the opportunities being offered. There's more opportunity to engage our community, hear their needs, hear their desires, and to serve them. And so um, being able to respond to that is gonna be important. Um, so some capacity action items uh, that we are looking at is to convert part-time uh, to full-time as, well as well as expand our athletic support specifically in the areas of staff and facility use. And to talk a little bit more about the full-time parks maintenance and why this is a need. Um, right now, uh, we have a mixture of um, full-time, part-time, and contracted services helping us in our parks to maintain um, a standard level of service. And um, we know that this is a midterm solution. When we began in 2020 to reframe what the Parks and Recreation Department uh, was gonna look like and will look like as we serve our growing community, we originally were focused on, we had one full-timer dedicated to the parks 
and a handful of part-timers. Um, and they all had um, limited skill sets and um, it wasn't allowing us to really truly take care of our park system the way it needed to be taken care of. And it wasn't putting us in a position to plan for the future either. And so what we've done is we've reorganized that department. You've seen um, the transition of our athletics coordinator uh, to the program and athletics coordinator. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in this presentation. Uh, and we've added a position. But the reality is we still can't operate as a full crew. Um, we're not as effective. We're not as efficient. And um, we knew that this was, it was going to take us stepping stones to get there. So our short-term solution was utilizing the part-time staff. Our midterm was utilizing some contracts to help us get there. And we're going to start to continue to see that kind of transition so that we're bringing that in-house uh, and we have more dedicated help. And that's important because it increases and expands the skill set and the ability of our staff. It increases our effectiveness and our efficiency. It increases our responsiveness. And it also allows us to get ahead and um, focus on preventative maintenance so that we can extend the life of the facilities and the investments that we make. And when we make this transition, we will combine uh, some of that, those part-time dollars that are spent, some of the dollars spent on contracted services to help cover the cost, the total cost of bringing in uh, a full-time parks maintenance person. Athletic support is another area that we are going to be challenged, we are challenged operationally. And I'm going to um, share kind of how we have had to operate our athletics program in the past. And it's when we um, schedule practices and when we schedule games, we handle that very differently with staffing. When we have department scheduled practices, we have relied on volunteer coaches to fully supervise that experience. Um, we have not provided town staff to be there at those times, at those locations. Um, when we have games, we do have staff there. Um, and it is, it's going to be impactful the more and more um, we move forward and the more we grow um, because we need to increase the support that our participants are having and our coaches are having uh, on a staff level. We need to be able to improve our communication with our participants. Um, we, need, we are already expanding the number of teams and I can just give you a snippet because we're still not done with registration. But as of this morning, our spring registration numbers were over 330. And last year, the same time, well, actually last year at the end of registration, we were at less than 215, I believe. So um, I, we have more than 120 um, additional participants this year. Now, there was a COVID impact on our numbers last year. So the last full year of spring or of, of athletics we had would have been the calendar year of 2019. And in 2019, our spring sports, we had 288. So we are still having some COVID impacts. We're still going through registration, but you're seeing that increase from the 2019 pre-pandemic number of 288 to today's number, which is currently 330. Um, we're also seeing a difference in how our Athletics programs are um, filling up. So baseball is something that always has an up and down. It, it's historically been that way. You'll have peaks where everybody wants to play baseball or softball, and then it kind of goes down a little bit, and then it comes back up. Um, it's just very natural with that sport. And what we're seeing right now is a huge increase in soccer. So our soccer participation um, is really exceeding the level of baseball participation. Um, that won't always be the case, but it is telling us something that our community is changing right now and their demands right now are very different. And so we're gonna have to be flexible. We're gonna have to use our spaces different. Um, I'm gonna share our baseball fields, they have lights on them. They've been programmed or we can program them after hours, well not after hours, but after dark. Our soccer fields, we can't program right now after dark because there are no lights on those fields. So early in the spring, you're very limited. Late in the fall, you're limited. It starts to get dark before that first team practice can even happen. And so we don't typically, we're not able to um, offer a second team practice in the evening because you run out of daylight. 
Um, there are things we're looking at doing in the interim until we're able to uh, increase those amenities at these facilities. And examples of that would be to use tree lights. Um, it's not the best answer, but it is a solution. We're also looking at alternative spaces um, that we can utilize. And so you might see us play soccer at Town Hall. You might see us um, play soccer in some of our outfields that are not used as much right now because we have a lower number of baseball or softball players. Um, so just expect to see some of those differences. Our basketball program, uh, prior to COVID, we had reached numbers where we really couldn't sustain that program and offer the best experience just at the community center. Um, if you've been in there when they were playing basketball, it is very, very tight. It is not the best for the actual game itself as you get to the older age groups. And so we had utilized the middle school gym uh, for some of the older age groups to help transition some of that flow, and it was a stepping stone. Uh, as we come out of COVID, you know, we had a slump in our basketball participation for a couple of reasons. Some of it was people were still nervous about COVID. The other was they didn't want to wear masks inside or abide by some of our policies that we had to implement in order to play basketball this year. So we would expect that as we come out of COVID, you will see those numbers increase and we will have to utilize other facilities in order to operate that program and serve our citizens. Um, let's see, make sure I didn't forget anything there. Okay. Um, in a capability review, uh, I think it's important to recognize we have a very diversifying community. And the example I gave you um, about baseball to soccer, and yes, there's those historical changes, but it's also telling you that there's a change in our community now. Um, so there are, our participants are more interested in different things, and so we have to be able to be responsive to that. Um, we also have uh, a change in expectation um, for these programs. We have an expectation of events as well, and those are all things that we've talked about. We even talked about this at our December work session uh, in detail, and I'll hit that in just a second. Um, and I provided some examples of how we're already transitioning our programming offering to have a variety to meet different needs of our community. But it's important to note that it's a process. Um, we, we are currently looking at planning almost for the entire year already and into next year to make sure that we are offering a variety and a little bit of something for as many people as we can. Um, and these things take time. They also impact one another. So it takes a lot of thought and coordination to put these things together. Um, I'm going to give the example of the Artist Mixer. So we've heard a lot of interest in cultural-based programs, art-based programs that weren't um, more of your like art party environment. Uh, so our response to that was to offer an Artist Mixer. Let's get our artists here. Let's work with United Arts, ZDAC, bring regional artists to Zebulon and let's see what skill sets we have to work with, um, who's interested in teaching. And it was very successful, but it still took us time even from doing that very successful program in September to, um, I think we released some programs yesterday from that um, process to work with these artists to build this, um, pr these programs that they wanna offer uh, and get it out marketed to the community. And I've got the example of the creative writing series um, because that is a result of the artist mixer. And in the coming days, we're gonna be announcing several others that came out of that process. Um, we will have to continue to seek sponsorships um, to make sure that we aren't trying to take everything on ourselves and we're not holding the burden completely. An example of that is a partnership with Skyhawks. Um, we've also got a partnership with something called Tennis Block. Um, so that's where we're not holding the full responsibility of being the primary recreation provider, and we are bringing in organizations that are <coughs> successful and are, have great reputations to help meet some of these needs. So operationally, some of the action items for addressing our capability are to expand recreational opportunities and um, something we've heard a lot about is implementing a downtown concert series. So with our department reorganization, uh, this past, this current budget year, we formally created a recreation division. 
and we recognized that we weren't truly, and I think this is a result of some of the things that Joe has talked to you about um, earlier tonight, you know, how we responded to the recession and other items, but we really have not been using our professional level programming staff in a capacity that maximizes the program output and how we serve our community. And so um, the current budget year, we were addressing some of that. We were shifting our focus, rethinking how we operate our department, and um, we have been able to free up the time um, of some of our programming staff uh, to come off of some of those like day-to-day -day tasks uh, to allow them to plan and implement more opportunities for our community. At your December work session, uh, we talked about um, some of the results of the master plan as well as some of the areas that y'all saw and heard from the community were priorities and would like to see us move forward. Um, some of those we've included here uh, are, you know, focusing on special needs programming, environmental education, our teens, outreach, and pre-K. Uh, we are already starting some of these initiatives, but to continue to grow, um, there will be additional costs to go with that. Um, I think before I skip to the next slide, it's really important um, that in addition to the partnerships that we share, we are also seeking self-led recreational opportunities. Uh, that's something that we've seen with COVID that a lot of community members um, across the nation have um, really taken into account that someone doesn't have to actually guide you through a program um, all the time and so there are opportunities that we can create where there are self-led experiences or maybe we can just completely rethink a space that we have that is underutilized and figure out a way that we can add offer a recreational experience on a regular basis that doesn't necessarily have an operational impact on our staff and our budget and so those are things we also look at um, the downtown concert series uh, if I could say there was one thing that I hear most frequently, it's that they really would like a downtown concert series. Um, and uh, we agree, it would be a great thing. It was also one of the items that came out of um, the work session we have in December. And so <coughs> what we're proposing and I uh, think would be great for our community is to do a three-month series on Horton Street. And Horton, the utilization of Horton Street is... Um, just kind of that final piece of the CIP work that we've been doing in the alley activation and working on some of our infrastructure items because we've been able to put in the power to support a band without having to have a generator. And that's really important because if you recall, bands prefer clean power because it's better on their equipment than to have to run off of a generator. And also then you have the noise that impacts the experience as well. Um, so we would love to bring in um, regional live acts, have food trucks, as well as some vending opportunities. And there's a total expected cost if you're using regional acts and we have to rent a stage, uh, as well as the impacts it would have on our staffing, a total cost of about $16,000 for that. There's sponsorship opportunities. These types of events usually are well funded by sponsors. Um, so that there's a revenue source that we could seek here. Um, and I'm also going to come back to that slide when we get going, done going through all of these to talk to you a little bit more about events throughout the year. Um, if we are looking at foreshadowing our facilities, our master plan does a fantastic job of looking at the types of facilities that you're going to need to serve a growing community and when to be expecting to have to build those to meet the demand as we grow. Um, so it takes a look at land acquisitions, um, development <coughs> of the parks um, that you acquire, as well as um, redevelopment uh, or renovations or expansions of your existing facilities. Um, I've added the rental and alternative uses. Uh, we talked about that a little bit more, but that will continue to grow. That's not going to go away. That's not a one year and done thing. That will continue to happen until we're able to build some of those facilities later uh, on, or not later on, but in future years. So as we foreshadow our staffing, um, I'm not going to necessarily go through every single position, 
Um, but I, I took the master plan because as we did the operational assessment and the staff assessment, we wanted to be very clear on as we grow, what is going to be the operational impact. And so as you add these facilities and you take on these projects, there will be an impact to our staffing. Um, so I've taken directly from the master plan uh, here and what we should expect at a minimum. Um, there were some other positions in there uh, that are a nicety, but I know that there are other things that this organization needs. And so I pulled the bare minimum if we did everything that's listed here, um, what we would expect to have to have at this point. And I'm only going to talk about a couple of, of them because some of them kind of tell the story themselves. But I'm going to talk about the athletics programmer. We had an opportunity as we go, went through the um, process in 2020. There was, you know, COVID impacted us severely. We were recognizing very obvious holes in our parks operation that we really needed help with. Um, because at the end of the day, we had a crew leader that oversaw the parks and they were reporting directly to me and I just didn't have the time to actually oversee the day-to-day -day operations of a parks department and deliver scripted work to a crew leader. Um, and they were working by themselves. And so we had the opportunity because COVID impacted our programs so severely um, and our athletics coordinator was already having parks responsibility. So in their job description, they were already responsible for um, field maintenance uh, and making sure that they were prepped and everything else. So we had, we had this opportunity to create a parks and athletics manager. We knew that this was an interim step and that as we grew and as we came back out of COVID, we were going to have to look to add an athletics programmer. Right now we're okay, but if we continue to see significant increases like we've seen this spring, that's not going to always be the case. And it also limits our ability to offer new programs, new experiences, because we have that diversifying community, as well as offer adult athletics, which we hear a lot that people would love to see. Um, as you do all of these projects, you're really going to need a parks planner. These are some pretty substantial projects to take on, and a lot of them going on at one time. At the same time, you have a lot of development going on. If we have a parks planner on staff, they would help with the review process of these developments to look at things related to parks uh, and greenways, as well as um, plan and implement these projects for us. Um, a special events and outreach coordinator, I think, is important. And I'll, we're going to return to this again when we talk about the downtown piece. But we offer a lot of um, community-based events and uh, like flagship events. Um, throughout our calendar year and we also recognize that outreach is going to be huge for us. Um, the way people get their information is always a moving target. Um, there, there are some people that used to say they had to see it seven times before they ever like really registered what you were trying to tell them. Um, but the truth is 10 years ago print media was the way to go. Now, eight years ago, people really did away with print media and were focusing on digital. Now, people are checking out the digital and are a little bit more interested in some mixture of the print and digital. Um, so the biggest thing that hasn't changed for our Parks and Rec Department is it's the face-to-face it's the -face relationships that you create with a community and word of mouth. That is what makes a big difference when it comes to marketing our community and marketing the services of our department. Um, the town needs a public information officer. A public information officer does not change how the Parks and Rec Department still has to have those relationships and still markets our programs. It helps. It helps tell the story of the town at large, but it doesn't take away from the fact that we still have to constantly, as programmers, be out there having those relationships with the community, finding out what it is that they want to do, what they want to see, how we can improve, and getting them to participate in our parks and our programs. And a maintenance worker, because as we continue to grow, as we continue to do more events, and as we continue to have more impact on our fields, being able to keep our parks maintained is going to be huge. We talked about having more eyes on our parks that will only grow. And 
we hear about it more and more, which is a great thing because I, we want our parks to be in the best position possible. And the sooner we can be responsive, the better off it is for everybody. And I think, if I figure out how to go backwards, I'm gonna take us back to the downtown slide, but I'm gonna let you ask questions first. What, what position is Nick Rummage in if he's not the athletics programmer? What is he doing now? He's our parks and athletics manager. Okay. Um, does Parks and Rec use public works equipment? Yes. Not all the time. I mean, we have some of our own, but not a lot. So, I mean, if we need a tractor or a bush hog or things like that, we have to go to public works. Are we paying the schools to use their courts? Mm -hmm. Or is that donated? So we have a joint use agreement with um, the two elementary schools. We do have to pay to use the indoor court and we have to go through it because that's not part of our joint use agreement. We actually, those rentals happen through communities and schools and not Wake County Public Schools directly. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? And I know that community and schools, are they still as high as they used to be when they would rent facilities? Yes. There are some communities neighboring us. <clears throat> um, gosh, I think Wake Forest was paying over $100,000 just to rent courts to run their basketball season. It's very expensive. Has there any been tried to negotiate with communities? I know they're part of the school system, yeah. correct? So, um, Pre-COVID, I mean, there was during COVID, there was a while where they weren't even let us, letting us in the facility. Um, they were closed. Um, we could run ours this year without them, so we didn't go back to them this mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. uh, but prior to that, we were talking with, we have, um, so Wake County Public Schools has that real estate department, mm -hmm. and we have someone assigned to us to handle our joint use park agreement. They're housed in the same department that oversees, I guess, the communities and schools rentals process as well. And I had had the conversation with them that, you know, this is really un an unrealistic price for all of these communities to have to pay. And um, they utilize our fields. And oftentimes, like, what we charge is nothing compared to what they charge. Mm -hmm. And so, we were had entertained conversations and we had talked with some of our cohorts and the other municipalities about um, pushing through a conversation to figure out how we can get a reduced rate. Um, but that is probably gonna happen in the next couple of months as it moves forward because our contact that we were working with has changed and we didn't have one for a while. So we just got a new one in the last two or three months. Because I just feel like if we're serving the children and the children are the students of the of Wake County, that there ought to be some type of... Yeah, I mean, I think that there's... I mean, we're always hearing it's a magnet school and they're trying to drum up interest and in people that want to be a part of that magnet school. So I think that there is a relationship there that just hasn't been fully framed and okay. we have time to do that. Okay. All right, um, Lisa, do you have that? I wanted to bring you back to the downtown concert series for just a second because um, there's, it'd be nice to have some indication from the board how they feel about this um, as we continue to plan our 2020 calendar of events. Um, we provided to you a draft of what a 2020 calendar of events would look, I mean 2022 calendar of events would look like. And so this is something that the board had asked us to do in 2020 um, was to create an annual calendar of events that we could share with the community. Um, because our community members really think on that calendar schedule and not necessarily on the fiscal year schedule. Um, unfortunately, COVID really impacted the effectiveness of that flyer because we had to cancel most of it. 
Um, but we would um, love an opportunity to revisit that, um, and if not this year, in future years, but this is what it would look like. Um, but I think this is that telling story of the amount of events that we offer um, as a department and as we grow, um, the impact of these events and how they evolve and how they grow um, tells that story of why you need that special events coordinator uh, and outreach coordinator. But it also tells the story of how these events kind of tie together and how we have to be very thoughtful on how we schedule them and um, when the best time to do these events are. So you wouldn't necessarily want to do that spring um, events or that spring downtown concert because you've got a lot going on in the spring and you have a hole in your calendar later in the year. Um, so it's just an opportunity. But I would love to get some feedback on kind of your thoughts on the downtown concert series because if that is something we want to do and it were to start in August, we can't wait until July to book bands. Um, really, we, those types of events are being booked right now because uh, that's going to offer you the best diversity uh, when you're looking at music and it's going to give you the best options for your community. I have another question. Yes. At one time you used Whitley Park, uh, the, the stage there, mm -hmm. and you would have local artists or local musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, why has that fallen? I mean, it hasn't, it's been several years since anything was done there. Yeah, so the last, I feel like I remember the Whitley Park Sunday, it was a Sunday music series at Whitley Park. It was, Park. it was on Sunday. So. Um, I don't think that's been done since probably 2010. Um, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a usefulness. Um, mm -hmm. What we would like to do, um, and like I said, I mean, this isn't everything we do. This isn't every right. event right. that we do. Um, this is just an example of the key events. Um, but neighborhood-based events are something we are definitely looking at. So our Rec on the Go opportunity, Popsicles in the Park we put on here because I think that has a lot of potential to grow and connect with our community. Um, but we will be looking for opportunities for reaching the immediate neighborhood by having those smaller acoustic opportunities and just interactive programs. I don't understand what that means. I'm sorry. You're reaching the neighborhood by having acoustic opportunities like going out into the neighborhoods and doing this? Um, Maybe. It's, it's very similar to like popsicles in the park where we just went to different parks and we're serving you know, we wanted more eyes on those parks so people were exposed to them, but mm -hmm. also introduce ourselves to the neighbors um, and get them to interact with us. Um, so we want to do that same thing on a bigger scale. It's going to take us time. It's going to take us staff to build that up. We can't, we've done, like, I think you attended when we did the neighborhood cookout at Whitley Park. I mean, we'll, that, that's what I mean, uh, where we have some acoustic opportunity. We have hot dogs available, different activities, and it's just very low key. Um, those will fill in to this uh, eventually, um, but it, it's just a matter of time. I think we did, we did one at Gill Street. We did the community coat drive and cookout. I mean, that's still on our radar. It's still in our schedule, um, but it didn't necessarily make the, the key big events that we've got going on. Are you waiting for something? Do you, do you need to know whether or not we're interested in pursuing? I'd just like pursuing. some feedback if it's something you're interested in us pursuing, not interested in it. Well, I'll speak on my behalf. I'm interested in you pursuing it. I said that, sure. Is there any other feedback? I'm a go on the concert series. I think it's a great idea. And it's in the fall, so we have plenty of time to plan. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, I, We've gotten a lot of good feedback, and we've obviously heard a lot of interest in it, so. Okay. Any other thoughts? It's a go for me. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you.
Okay, I'll tell you in advance, I was hesitant about sharing this slide with you, so give me an opportunity to tell you what it's not and then why I'm showing it to you. So what this is not is not a summary of the budget that will come before you. It's not even a summary of the things that were presented to you tonight. So as an example, in the police line item, the 428000 that could change. That could change if we're successful in getting grants. Um, the 97000 that could change as we realize some efficiencies in converting uh, part-time money to full-time money. Um, and that will definitely change because I've failed to capture some of the costs in fire. So that fire number is actually low. So that's, this is not a running summary. It's really a highlight to demonstrate a point that right now, and you've heard from three departments, we're a little over 600,000. You've got more frontline departments and more support uh, uh, service departments to come before you. You will have or I will have, in order to give you a budget, uh, a balanced budget, more requests than we have revenue. And, they, and the relevance of that is because that fits into the purpose of the budget and the budget schedule. So the budget, it's not an annual right of balancing debits and credits, even though you have to have a balanced budget. The budget document is a, it's a policy document. And what it does is it prioritizes prioritizes those programs and projects that you think are the most important. Everything that we as a staff are gonna bring before you are gonna be uh, programs and projects within the three focus areas of vibrant downtown, growing smart, small town life. But only you can prioritize what is the most important. So we'll continue to front load information to you before you actually receive the budget. So you'll have the next community assessment work session on March 17th. Uh, you'll hear from more uh, departments, the uh, front line as well as some support departments. Those that you haven't heard from on the 17th, you'll hear from on April 21st. We'll also have some information for you at the April 21st work session on revenue estimates, as well as uh, more detailed information on your general fund fund balance. May 2nd, as your budget officer, I will present a balanced budget. While that's a recommended budget and it's a balanced budget, once I hand it over, it is the board's budget to do what they wish. So if they wish to finally adopt the budget that I recommend, that's great. If they modify it and it's something different than what I recommend, that's great as well. But in order to do that, you'll need to utilize the work sessions that are made available for you as a group to discuss and prioritize what's most important. When I bring forward a budget, I can guarantee you now all the things that you've heard tonight and all the things that you will hear about in the two subsequent uh, budget work sessions or the uh, community assessment work sessions, it's not gonna be in the budget. We just won't have enough money. Um, and you will have to have a dialogue about does that match your priorities or not? And so that's the intent of the budget work sessions. At the conclusion of the budget work sessions, you'll be in a position to offer to the community for their input in a public hearing format their thoughts on that budget ordinance. At the conclusion of that public hearing, you will have satisfied all the statutory requirements that the state of North Carolina puts upon you when formulating and adopting a budget. So you can adopt a budget that night, but you have to adopt a budget no later than July 1st. So that's just an overview of the budget uh, schedule and process that will be coming your way. Um, I'm getting ready to recognize Chief Perry, but before I do, I'll take any final questions or comments. Okay, Chief Perry. So I'm here to, tonight to talk about the fire EMS station project. You may have questions and um, where are we at? Where did we come from? This, this project has been going on long enough that it may predate some of you and your service to the board. So uh, we want to spend just a few minutes um, talking about how we got to where we're at. Where are we on, on this project and what's next? So that's 
That's, that's my, if you will, my agenda for the next few minutes. I'm going to back us up to, to the 2017 uh, retreat. And we were in a situation in 2017 that the town had purchased property for a second fire station on Green Pace Road. Um, there were a lot of questions regarding what should we do next. Um, and so that, that started the conversation at the 2017 retreat. And uh, if, I, if I get to going too fast, please, y'all, don't mind asking me questions as we, we go through this. So we identified back in 2017, why do we need a fire station? And it was, too, it was multifaceted. It was the service level part and it was the facility part. On the service level part, it was based on a couple of things and establishing this travel time. And you've heard me make mention to it already tonight that our goal is based on a five minute and 30 second response time. That is based on at one and a half minutes for our crews to get in the trucks and on the road and four minutes of travel. Um, that wasn't a number that we just came from out of the air. Uh, the four minute travel time is based on uh, statistically speaking how quickly uh, fires develop to a flashover stage and extend beyond a room in contents. In other words, how quickly can we get there and make effectively save someone's home? And that's where the four minute travel time comes from. Likewise, we take EMS incidents, EMS emergencies, and we apply the same logic. How quick should we get there? This graph talks about uh, cardiac arrest survival and how quick we need to get there and get, make sure that CPR and effective defibrillation occur and we come back to that same four minute window. So that's the basis and you, I said you've already heard me mention it one time tonight, but that's the basis of what we use for how quickly do we need to get to somewhere from the fire station. So that was the question in front of us. Where can we get in four minutes? And that, that graphic indicates where we're at today. Um, and when you look at it, this graphic kind of illustrates our four minute travel time. Um, and that's a, obviously makes somewhat of a spider web looking circle. Um, there were days where our fire station was pretty centrally located in the town and most everything was in, within that four minute travel. But that, as you can see, things are changing. We went back in and looked at actual, you know, the, the line you just saw was developed by a computer and a computer model. And I, I like computer models as, as good as the next guy, but I want to make sure they're good, they're right, that they're accurate. So we pulled actual travel time data from the previous year to say, does it match? Is, is what our spider web, does that look? And you can see those blue dots represent the um, calls that we were able to get to within that four minute travel time. The red indicates those that were outside, and it's very, very similar to what you saw in the spider. So that that's a that's a good is a good indicator for us. And here's the situation: we've got that four-minute travel, but they keep building homes, and our town keeps growing outside of that area. And that's what brought us to the to the question of what do we need to do because we continue to to develop and grow outside of our travel time goals. We also had the part about the facility needs because it, it's not all about just the, the, the service, it's about our facility. Um, again, we've already made mention to the, the, the constraints that we're in um, and this, this slide provided a little historical reference. Our building built in 1974, added on to in the 1980s. <clears throat> uh, office areas were added into the 1990s. All of that occurred with absolutely no um, uh, 24 hour staff in mind. Our, our building was built and added onto and everything was either a completely volunteer system or even in those later years, um, just some daytime supplement that just kind of helped our, our volunteers. Only in the 2000s did we see the addition of a sleeping quarters and that was just something to, to provide a, a small crew. Um, and you can see all of those, those areas in our current facility today. Um, what we knew was when we look at those areas, our Bay Area was too small when we compare it to today. Our training room, it seats about 24 people. Um, I've already told you if everybody's there, there's about 65 people. Um, we typically don't have meetings where it's everybody because we just can't accommodate them. Um, if we do, for example, what is a common thing of our paid staff part-time and our, our volunteers, um, that's, a, that's right at 50 people. 
in a room that t typically accommodates 24. So we, um, this has been a very big struggle for us during COVID because we would get warm and cozy and, and very friendly um, pre-COVID, but now we've moved a lot of our meetings to the Bay Area to accommodate that. Our office space as well, a deficient area. Um, our fire inspector, as an example, uh, we made an office out of a closet. We moved out the filing cabinets and moved in a desk. Um, so it, that just gives you one idea of the deficiencies there. And one that's of, of even more concern lately, our, our sleeping quarters sleeps five people. Um, we regularly have uh, six and seven people staying at the fire station because our, especially our younger volunteer firefighters love to stay at the fire station at night. We love for them to stay at the fire station. That's free on duty help, um, but they find themselves sleeping in chairs and in on couches because we just don't have sleeping places for everyone to sleep. Um, but we can accommodate five people in our current sleeping quarters. Um, we've got five beds, I should say. And in our support areas as well, um, laundry, gear storage, equipment storage, as you can imagine, we've taken every little ounce of storage space and most of it's been converted to office space or, or what have you. So we kind of looked at options back in 2017. We thought about we could, we could take our fire station and we could build another station out at Green Pace Road. That was one of the options that was in front of us on the land that had been built. We could go out there and um, find another place, something different from Green Pace Road. Maybe that was a better location. That was a question in front of us. Or maybe we just scrapped the whole idea and just go find a good idea, a good location somewhere and put the fire station there. So what we talked about with the board back in 2017 was having a study um, commission to figure all this out for us, to develop a financial plan and, and figure out where do we go from there? And that's exactly what occurred. So for there, I'm gonna fast forward to 2018. We came back to the board in 2018 at their retreat, and we came back with them with the results from a study from Brooks Innovative Solutions, um, a fire service delivery uh, consultant who was able to help us figure out a lot of the questions that I just discussed with you. They gave us several recommendations, but to summarize those, they told us to go into work to relocate our existing fire station. Um, they felt that Jablin had not grown to the point that it needed multiple fire stations. It just needed a fire station in the right place. Um, they also looked at, for example, they looked at building a new fire station on our existing site. Um, although it had merits, we could, we could fix some of our issues. We would still be, in their eyes, in the wrong place. Um, they told us to consider using some call share partnerships, Wake County Fire Services, the group responsible for our county services could, 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 could and should help pay for a fire station. And Wake County EMS had already told us if we build a new fire station, they wanted to be a part of the project. So uh, Brooks re re recommended we explore those partnerships. Develop a long-term plan for additional fire stations that whatever we did would, be, would, would provide for the town, but not to think that one station would be it. We would need additional stations in the future. And they also felt that the Green Pace Road property was not an effective site uh, and something that we should, we should stay away from. They asked us to relocate our fire station to a more efficient location. And then they gave us some, some parameters of what that, that station and what that site should look like uh, in terms of acreage. <coughs> so we came back to the board in 2019. So that was the 2018 version. We came back in 2019. Um, and we, we brought the board up to speed at the end. We gave them the, op, the, the proposal to develop, to put a new fire station centrally located that would address our current and future facility needs. In other words, build a facility that was in the right place, that took care of our, our location issues, but it met those facility needs that we had as well. At the time, we knew that we could do that without, with our existing staffing levels. We wouldn't have to hire additional people um, because of the anticipated workload that we saw back in 2019. And we thought we had a good chance of building on those partnerships. Um, one of our partners was, was to be Wake County EMS, um, kind of like a roommate, if you will, split the rent and that's kinda, that kind of mentality. Um, Wake EMS told us that um, they, they weren't real crazy about going in the downtown area. They wanted something north of that location, something that got them closer to the US 64 corridor if, if, we were, if they were to be a part of it. 
If they were a part of it, they would use funding from the general fund, which was an additional um, funding source, and they would have a proportional use of the building. In other words, if they used 20% of the building, they intended to pay for 20% of the building. Um, the other thing with the side relationships, the potential relationships that um, would be beneficial, an example was facility design and construction. Using their expertise to help in the construction and design of the building um, would be an added benefit um, to, to us as we constructed the building that kind of go beyond that uh, proportional funding that they would provide. Then there was the fire, tis, the fire tax district side, those, the county paying for their part. Um, they saw proposed locations had positive impacts, just like with the town, were not centrally located, so they, they more wanted to see us in more of a central location to be able to serve um, the county area better and, and improve some response times in some areas. They would put their, bring their money to the table from the Wake County Fire Tax District, which is a, a tax added to those county residents. Um, they have a, a funding source that's dedicated towards new fire station projects. One key part of their, their funding on the fire station project was it was contingent on relocating our existing site. Um, Wake County was not interested in partnering if we decided to build a second station, only if we relocated our existing site simply because they felt that for the county's purposes, one fire station was, was enough. And if we were building a second fire station, that would be something that the, that the town needed, but the county did not. So they, they would not partner on an additional fire station. So we began to look at what, were, what types of things would we look at when we look at different land sites. And these were some of the ideas we came up with. We would look at the size of the lot, the location, feasibility, all these that you see here as we try to figure out how we would go about um, evaluating potential fire station sites. Our consultant had, gave, had given us a, this um, square and said, this is your primary, um, this is your primary area. If, if you see where the star is in the center, um, that would be the, the primary location he recommended for a fire station. Um, it could be a little north, it could be a little south, but it needed to be somewhere in, that, in the area of that star. So if you kind of overlay a, a target, if you will, if we went too far north of that, we exposed too much of the southern part of the municipality. Likewise, if we too far south of that, we exposed too much of the north. So uh, their recommendation was stick as close as you can to the center of the target to be most effective. The, the goal is, is to get the most amount of our municipality within that four minute travel window. So then we went through and we started looking for any piece of property or combinations of pieces of property that we thought would be acceptable, um, that would be available. Um, some we knew were too small, but we, we put them into the assessment batch. Um, this is not all the properties that we um, looked at, but these were. I took this slide directly out of what went to one of the um, board presentations. Um, we looked at additional sites later um, as well. Any sites that came up, we looked at. Keeping in mind that that whole interchange area is the center of our target area. From that, we evaluated each one of them on a, on a number of issues. Um, there was quite a variety of lots, quite a variety of zoning. Access was very um, varied on the different sites. So we, we looked at the pros and cons of each site. From there, we drew up a, a matrix of, of sorts where we began to compare all these sites and sites that came after those. And we, we kind of scored each one of them in a, in a green light, yellow light, red light type of um, um, methodology, if you will. Green meaning it was good or acceptable. Yellow, it was questionable. Um, and in the red, it was just unacceptable. And you can see, as an example here, acreage. If the property was just too small, then it was red. Um, location, you know, were we right in the middle of the target? Were we north of it, south of it? Those that were within the target or the center of the target got the green, so to speak. Um, was EMS interested in co-locating? There were some sites we picked, EMS said, if you choose to go there, that's fine, but we're, we're not interested in that site. And I'll give you an example. Um, one of them was an old Bun Road site that was available. EMS said they did, there wasn't access to 64 there. They weren't interested and they would, they would choose not to partner with us if we went to that site. Um, 
And then the last one, or the, you see the roadway access, some of the properties were uh, completely unaccessible currently, so we would have to build roads to get to them. Others were in areas where traffic improvement would need to be uh, done to be able to use them. So that's how we kind of continue to um, look at those different sites and, and assess them and, and figure out what was next. So from that, we, we ended up, that's where we, how we got to the GSK site, which surrounds this site. Um, the, the GSK site was selected because it was in the target area. Um, it was accessible. Um, the, the, there were other sites that were also identified. This was, if, 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 you, if I can use the word, the most affordable site. Some of the sites that we picked were well outside of our budget. Um, this one uh, was much closer. Um, so that's how we ended up with the GSK site. And some of you remember there was quite a bit of discussions um, as that property was ultimately acquired um, using those, mostly those funds that had been set aside for the, um, for the fire station project. We went through and took that site and even took a couple of the other sites that had been as potential sites. And we asked the question, could a fire station effectively go on this site? This is just one of the site plans. Um, the board at the time, and some of y'all recall this, saw a couple of different versions of site plans um, to see could it fit? And you know, would we necessarily arrange it this way? Would we necessarily, would the footprint look like this? Maybe, maybe not, but could we make this thing work? And that was, that was kind of how we got, again, I use this example, from the, uh, from the GSK site with a uh, Judge Street uh, facing facility. So where are we at today? Um, to kind of bring us up, you know, where, how did we get, where did we end up at? Um, we have an agreement on funding partnership with Wake County. Through all of this um, and many, many conversations and discussions, um, Wake County has committed to our project on the EMS side of the house, and keep in mind that's a general fund contribution to the project, um, that they will pay that proportional share. Um, early estimates are that'll be about a 20% contribution, which is, um, which is good to see how that kind of, if, that, if their usage of the building were to increase, we would see that, um, that funding ch percentage change accordingly. Um, and then the fire tax, through their methodology that they use and have they developed a funding methodology because there were a lot of fire departments coming to the table saying, we want you to help us pay for our facilities. Um, us, Fuquay, Apex, Roseville, Garner, we were all kind of in the mix at the same time. So they developed a methodology. And what they determined is that the total contribution from the county would not exceed 49%. So that left a 29% fire tax um, contribution. The 49% is significant because it retains ownership of the, of the building and the property with the town of Zabulon. Should the county contribute more than the 49%, then they feel that they should be the owner of the property and be responsible for the building. So there's, there's, there's more to that 49% than just math. It has to do with ownership of the property as well. Wake County also agreed to manage design and construction of the project. Um, they have a department that does only that. They're very, very good at what they do. Um, they've built multiple fire and EMS facilities in Wake County, so um, that was a, that's, a, that's a really big, huge benefit. Um, and we would um, commission a GIS study to, to go in there and figure out where do we need to go from there. Um, we, the GIS study that, that is in process is doing a couple different things. One, it's saying does the data still support putting a fire station at the town hall site. Um, we've received word that the, the, that study does continue to say, we need one at this 96 uh, US 64 interchange as the primary fire station. Um, the, how do we, what do we do after that is exactly what that group continues to work on to get us some answers on that. Next steps, so where do we go from here should we decide to continue uh, the next step would be a memorandum of understanding with Wake County for station design. Let me be, let me be very um, specific about that as we get into the, the memorandum of understanding that's been provided to you tonight. When, the, when I say station design as is addressed in the memorandum of understanding in front of you, that is for schematic design. 
Um, it serves the purpose of figuring out how does this building, what does the floor plan look like, what, it, could it, um, what could it look like from the outside, and that is essential in determining how much will this facility cost. Um, we don't, we have some preliminary cost estimates, but they're, it's, it's based, basically no different than if you were going, someone asked you how much does a car cost, you can estimate that, but if you don't know what kind of car you're buying, you don't know how much it would cost. So this would be a way to determine what will the facility cost and what would it look like. Also in this memorandum of understanding is public engagement. It was identified early on by the commissioners um, that public engagement was, would be, was to be a key part of this project, and that is included as well, where the public will be asked to weigh in on their feelings on what the uh, station design should consist of. What does it look like? How does it fit into the, the, the landscape, if you will? So that would be a part of the project as well. Um, cost for schematic design are included already within the town's budgets. The Wake County's um, general fund budget for the EMS portion and within the fire tax. So even the schematic design would be shared by those three partners as well. And all of that money has been budgeted previously. So there's, there's no money allocation that would, would, new money that would have to be allocated. So I get a few questions that I, that I get on a regular basis and I hope this may add to our conversation tonight. Um, the question, why not build a smaller substation somewhere instead of building a main station? That's a very, very uh, good question and a question I get a lot. To build a, a smaller substation somewhere would address our distribution need quite well, but it would fail to, to identify or uh, address our facility issues. Uh, we could build a small station somewhere and put a crew in it and uh, Im improve our response times but as an example, that still wouldn't get um, our fire inspector out of the closet that he currently works in. That still wouldn't change our 24 people training room with a, staff, with a fire and fighting crew of 50. It wouldn't address any of those. So that's why the, um, the, the single station versus the multiple stations. Um, additionally, should we choose to do that, we would essentially forfeit one of our partners and that the fire tax funding has already decided that they, they, would, not, um, they would not help with it. I will mention, I, I failed to mention it, but um, when the town originally looked at building a substation on Green Pace Road, the, the county declined to partnership on that as well for the exact same reason. So um, they've been pretty consistent with that message on the substation. Another question I get is, why was the municipal complex site recommended? Well, that's a lot of what I just went over with you. Um, that was, it was picked not because it was at town hall, but it was picked because we evaluated many, many sites um, and it became the, the, the site of preference due to location relative to the target, due to affordability of the property. Um, there, there were other pieces of property that were um, equally uh, located in the target, but were just quite frankly were millions of dollars uh, for the property for much smaller amount of property. Um, another good thing about the municipal complex site was the, the future Judge Street connector. Um, our, our GIS consultants continue to bring up with the complete with the completion of Judge Street to Worth Hinton that will provide connective connectivity to the western side of town that we do not currently have from this location. Um, what are the consequences of waiting to build the station? Um, another question that I get from time to time, why don't we just wait on this and just see? Um, obviously that is an option, um, but the town continues to grow, to grow in those areas that are remote from our location. Um, the, the Old Bun Road sites, the, the sites off to the north. Um, so our travel times are going to be outside of our, uh, our goals. Um, travel times are going to be longer than we'd like them to be. Um, we will continue to work within the operational constraints. Um, the best thing I can think of is just like the administrative assistant conversation we've already had tonight. Um, that's just one example of the, the things we're, we're currently hindered by our um, sleeping quarters as an example. And then the last comment that I'll make on that, we've, we have been re we've got reached out to by Wake County EMS. As some of you know, they are operating out of a temporary facility in the back of the regional center. Um, they have a, they're erecting a shelter to park an ambulance in, and they're really wanting a home for their EMS truck in the Wake County area. Um, 
They have told us that they, they really, really want to be a part of our project. But if, if the town decides that's something we don't want to do right now, then they're going to go ahead and, and locate another facility and build their own facility um, somewhere else, which would remove one of our partners from the project funding. And lastly, what are concerns with building on Judge Street, um, with having residential neighbors? And, and we've talked to a bunch of different municipalities and otherwise that have constructed fire stations in residential areas. And everybody gave us the exact same answers. The key to the success is citizen input and building an appropriate, um, using an appropriate site and building design, which is very much what, what you as, a, as the board said, it wanted citizen input and everybody that's done it said, that's the way you make it, um, you make it uh, work. And that's the way it makes it uh, hospitable to everybody. Um, the feedback we got is you do it that way. Most people, once the fire station is built, um, don't want to see it leave. They find it to be an integral part of their, their neighborhood and they, and they like the fact that the fire station is, is close and, and is a good neighbor, if you will. Um, so with that, um, we have distributed, or Lisa distributed the, the memorandum of understanding. Um, so you would have that. You can, you can um, welcome the to look at that, ask any questions. If you'll, if you'll bear with me just a second, I want to point out just a couple of things for your, for your um, clarification. On page two, and I think it, does everyone have a highlighted copy? Is your copy highlighted? Yes. Okay, so good. Thank you. Um, that C on that with the, the um, I'm sorry, A talks about that schematic design, and, and I just want to point that out. That this this agreement does not. Um, does not authorize anybody to do any full-fledged. Um, it is a preliminary design. Um, and you see that in, in section C where I highlighted it. It gives you some examples of what really is schematic design. Um, it talks about a lot of things, obviously the, the cost share percentage, those types of, of, of items. Um, it goes into some other, again, most of it you, you would see and you would understand. It talks about how the funding would be, uh, one would be invoiced to the other. Um, one the county's work would be invoiced back to us if, if we're due for part of that. And then I highlighted on, and I apologize that these don't have page numbers, but in section five, responsibilities of the town of Zabelin, you see the community engagement piece. Um, that is included in this agreement as well. It's included because it's a function of the architect to facilitate and lead those discussions and the architect, uh, is and would be under contract with the county. Um, the county has an architect that they have already pre-selected for all of their fire and EMS facilities, so they would use that architect um, to do the, the solicitation, I mean, uh, the, um, to solicit the input from the um, citizens on the matter. So, um, and then the last thing I'll mention that, that I found helpful as I read through it is in section eight, the contemplated sequence of events. Um, for me, I just I needed a better understanding of how does how does this progress as we go through, and the county has kind of laid out what they've done, and it steps us through exactly how this project would occur. Um, and you see where the author the first step is authorizing this document, then the county does the same, and in, in, in B, C, the the community engagement process would occur, and then after that, the county in D would make sure that the schematic design is developed. That schematic design comes back to say, is, is this what we wanted in E? And then in F, those, the boards, this board as well as the county uh, commissioners would see those schematic, schematic designs and begin to make decisions. Um, do, is this something we proceed with? Do we not proceed? Do we send it back, if you will? Um, after those boards approve it, then it, a design consultant comes in um, Again, that's, excuse me, that's where the, the proceeding with the project occurs. And then after that occurs, a new agreement will be drawn up with the county. Should, if the schematic design is approved, a new agreement is, design, is drawn up that carries them through the full design process and um, <coughs> up into including construction. And then the project continues on until we get into lease and um, utilization agreements by the different, the, the, both us uh, obviously, we would need a utilization agreement, but Wake County EMS would need one as a um, 
I know tenant's not the right legal word, uh, Mr. Vernon, but some, you know, as, as, a, as a part of the a user of the building. So um, what I've got in front of you, and I, I guess I'll turn it back over to, to, to Joe if there's any other questions or comments, but the, this would be the next step should the board decide to, to, to carry it on. Um, and you, this, hopefully this gives you a feel for what that next step includes. And it, uh, I think it's key to bring this up as you talk about bonds and if the fire station project is to be part of the bonds, um, the, this schemat the schematic design referred to in the memorandum of understanding provides a lot more information as far as costs and what's all involved in the project. So um, with that, I'll take any questions or that you may have. Can you help me understand like the lot size? I just want to understand that. I see that's one of the criteria that you're looking at. Yes, sir. So I can get a little bit better understanding of that. Sure. Please. So the, uh, one of the disadvantages of a fire station is there's a lot of impervious surface. Um, concrete, the building itself due to the bay, um, so that, that necessitates a little bit of a larger lot than what you typically would need. Uh, and I am absolutely not the person to talk about impervious surface, but I know that I know, uh, storm water, ability to, to uh, contain storm water and that kind of thing. And then the second piece is just acreage for training. Um, th those areas that are, are front aprons and rear aprons also serve as training areas. So that, that is what kind of gets you up to the, to the acreage that you see there. Okay. It also seems like we're kind of piggybacking major importance of like partnering with EMS. Is there a reason for that? I mean, just, we just want, can you give me a little better understanding as well, please? So the, um, there's a lot of, not that this is the reason, a lot of places are partnering with EMS. So why do we do it? One, um, it keeps from having duplicate facilities, a, a fire station and then a very similar facility in a close proximity. Economically, it's, be, it's smarter as partners to build one facility to house both fire and EMS and build two very similar facilities close together. So that, that's where the partnership, it, it, the benefit for us is it provides a funding source to help us build the building. Yeah, yeah. Joe brings up a very good point. We, if, if they uh, partner with us in the project, then we've got a lot of say so. We be in the town and where that facility is located. Should EMS decide to go on their own, they may choose not to build it in Zabelin at all. They may choose to build it halfway between Zabelin and Roseville so that they can cover that area and this area. Um, it does give us um, a, a kind of, in a, in a roundabout way, it gives us some, some input into where they, their EMS resources are located. And we definitely want those close to home. That's for so sure. with that said, would that affect the time frame EMS will respond to our citizens here in Zebulon? Yes, sir. Yeah, if they, if they choose to be located somewhere else, that could create a delay. Um, EMS is a very, um, um, they're very system um, demand oriented on locations. So they, they, they don't mind moving their resources around based on where they think they may need them. It's good to have an EMS station in your area, to have a home base for them to, to operate out of. So we have heard from other folks, well, the board has with the exception of Commissioner Miles, that we need to be thinking about two stations. We have been told that we have to be thinking about two stations, but now what I'm hearing right now is that if we put up two stations, then we're not going to be funded by some of these other partnerships. So I need to have an understanding of where the disconnect is between sure. what we've been told. Sure, so a, a lot of where the, the two station um, conversation came from is, is the desire to, to cover as much area as we can cover. Um, it would be, it, two stations would be really, really easy if we were growing in one direction. Um, we're, growing, we're growing in all different directions, at least three different directions, if not four different directions. Um, there will be a need for, for a second fire station um, and ultimately a third fire station at some point as well. Um, but right now, we can cover, we statistically speaking, about 85% or better with one fire station if it's in the right place. 
Um, so do we, are we going to need a second fire station? Definitely, without a doubt, because we're, we're maxing out the, the, what we can do with a single fire station. Um, our belief is, is we, we do that, we, we, we locate one fire station in the best location possible, and then when we need a, another fire station, then we, we go with that. Um, it, like I say, if we could put a second fire station in, but honestly speaking, we could add one more and we'd still have a lot of areas that we couldn't cover because we're, going, we're just growing in different directions. Okay, well then how come we've been told that we need to have two, and I believe at one point Joe was even saying that we were gonna have to be start thinking about even having three fire stations. That's going to, and please correct me if I'm understanding this wrong, that's gonna jeopardize the percentage of money that we have coming in through these partnerships, or do they reevaluate with the growth of our town the need for us to have, I mean, I, I'm a little bit confused why they get to tell us how many fire stations we have okay. <laughs> yeah. to begin with. No, no, that's a great question. So um, each capital project is looked at individually. Um, the county has an established, for example, I, I gave you all the, the, our goal, our five minute and 30 second goal, um, which is not something we just dreamed up. It's, it's statistically sound. Well, Wake County has chosen a different goal. Of, um, of seven and a half minutes, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so by doing that, they don't need as many fire stations because they, they're willing to take that it takes longer to get to their sites. So when they use their numbers of seven and a half minutes as their goal, um, all it takes is one fire station and, and they're good. So um, based on that, they said, we'll fund one fire station in Zabelin but we don't want to fund any more than that. If, if you fund more, that's something that you, you're doing on your own. So um, that's kind of how they, if, if we add a station, you got a fire station. If we're building one fire station, they're in. Um, so that's their methodology. If it doesn't change our, share, our cost share, because that is independent of capital projects, so the 37%, as an example that we talked about earlier tonight, that would not change at all. That's based on our service area. Um, what, that, what causes that to change is annexation and, and the, those factors that I mentioned. When those change, our, our cost share percentage changes. But um, it, it won't, there's no, the capital projects are specific to the project at, at the hand. Um, honestly, if we got ready to build a fire station 10 years from now, we, I'm sure we would ask the county to help fund that. Uh, they would evaluate it based on the criteria that they were using at the time. But currently what they've told us right now is one fire station for the Zabelin area is all we need to is all we all we need to participate in. Beyond that is just extra fire stations. I don't know if but I helped so, you at so all. So they will they will fund and participate in one station. That's correct. And if we build another station, they're not going to pull their participation from the original station. You're exactly right. Okay. You're all exactly right. right. Thank you. Th thank you for the quick because that's you're exactly right. It, it, we don't jeopardize it when we build future facilities. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, what's the comment from the county as far as operational expenses of the facility? If they're kicking in 20% towards EMS, will they cover 20% of the annual operating expenses? Yeah, that is something we got to work out. I think there's already a methodology because the, the county is already within these arrangements with other municipalities. So I don't know, I don't know what their math is on it. Um, I know from the county fire side, it's, it falls right into our cost share methodology that they've already established. But I, would, uh, I, I don't know what they use for ongoing expenses. Um, my guess is that they do share some of the operational costs, but, but I, I don't know for sure. Well, that's something we can find out. And that's the same for EMS as well as Wake County Fire, or is that assumed to be part of our annual that's right. So we know fee. fire. the fire part would be shared as part of our normal operating budget. They share all of our costs. Then I, the question I need to find out is would EMS participate in those um, sharing of costs as well? That's, that's something I can find out and get back to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Did you stay? Did not. you stay that? Yeah, just for the, I, I, did, I didn't push any special button and say now's the time. Um, but I got to hand it to him. The timing was perfect. Yeah, that's, but our guys are good. I, I, 
I make no bones about it. <laughs> so, so this um, uh, memorandum of understanding is, is is basic that most of our mun municipalities are using. Yes, sir. I can tell you. I know Fuquay is under. I believe Fuquay um, is currently under an ex the same agreement, and I believe that I'm not mistaken, but I believe the town of Garner is as well. And then Apex is there about where we're at. They're getting ready to adopt one. Um, a very, very similar type of agreement. And, and everybody, if I can, everybody's doing kind of, they're taking advantage of the county's design, facility design staff, because they're, they're very, and Chris can tell you better than, than I. He, he works with them a lot. I, I work with them as coworkers when I work with the county, but as a, as a customer in, Chris has much more experience with them. And they're just a good team that you, you, you like managing your construction projects. They do very well with that. And you had mentioned something about the architect uh, piece in it. Uh, is that already included funding-wise? Yes, sir. The architect for the schematic design. Um, there's not this, – this agreement doesn't go anywhere beyond schematic design. So um, uh, landscape, layouts, what it would look like from the street, uh, how the building, the interior, interior we laid out, and those kind of things. My understanding that this this agreement, um, and I guess I'll defer to Joe, but th this agreement is something that could come to you at, at at another at a next meeting, another meeting for possible adoption should you choose to do so. But now's a, the time to kind of work through the any questions you might have. Like One last question for me, Chris. When they were doing this analysis, what kind of input did they come to you with? What kind of input did you have when they kind of came to you, your expertise, when they were doing the analysis, all these different locations? What kind of role did you play in it? So on the, on the site analysis? Correct. That, that was all done internally. Um, so the consultant said, here's a big circle. Ideally, you'll be in that circle. So internally with staff, um, we looked for p potential properties and did all the comparing of the different things. I, I say staff, it was us, planning helped. Uh, we reached out to realtors, we used um, IBAPs, we used any resource we could find, you know, a piece of property that, that was vacant and contacted somebody and say, hey, what, what was the status of this piece of property? So we did all of that internally. Okay. So as we, we stand now, this is, this is the option that we'll we're looking at as far as location. We don't have a plan B possibility. So right now, um, do we have a plan B? That's that's a great question. So this is this piece, the piece of property, the GSK property, was selected as the as the primary location. Um, of course, obviously, as each one of you know, that that property was acquired. Um, we don't have like a, if, if you decide not to use this, um, we, we don't have a, a second piece of property sitting ready to go. Um, if there was a decision not to locate here, we would, we would see, um, see what's available and present options relative to that. Um, some of those options we already know because we, we, we sought those out several years ago, but obviously that could be updated, but uh, we're, not a, we're not aware of a, of a really good Plan B option. Um, we're aware we're, we're of plenty of very expensive Plan B options, um, but not not aware of any other ones. Yeah, I think this is obviously going to take more discussion later. Uh, mm -hmm. There's traffic issues, roadway issues, and when I look at Section Eight. Uh, I tend to think item C should actually be the first item there, not the third item, where we actually start the process before we actually involve the community, at least for some input. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, what you see in relative to item C is primarily on um, community engagement related to um, site design. You know, what is it? What is what does the building look like? Um, th that's the that's the emphasis of, of what you see reflected in C is community engagement into into design of the facility. 
Um, and it, you, what you may be referring to may be outside of the scope of it, It's outside of that about talking about the possibility before we talk about the building, because we're basically saying we may have a location identified, but I think we had, need to have some more community involvement before we just take off saying that's the location and this is what the building may look like. Mm -hmm. Just my perspective, I don't know about the rest of the board. I agree with that, yeah, I agree with that. And I'll add, I do think it's urgent and can't be drug on. This is a decision we're gonna to have to address relatively quickly. And I don't like there's not a plan B. <laughs> Which one did you say, Joe? Yeah, for, for example, and uh, the, the site located just north of the interchange, as far as I know, is still available. Um, you know, that would probably, when it comes to proximity to the target, that would be the probably the next closest. And I think it's memory serves me that is the acreage is sufficient. Um, I think it's just a three, four million dollar piece of property. Three. Yeah. So, uh, and then when you when you go beyond that, you begin to see that quite a few of them don't meet the. Um, they either don't meet the acreage requirement. There's a there's a track of land that borders US 64 between Arundel and Shepherd School Road, but I think it's 15 acres, I believe. Um, and we inquired about subdivision, and at the time they were not interested in any in any any sub. They wanted to sell the entire 15 acres. And I think that was like five. That's million. the Massey land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that that may that may give you a little more flavor as to how we ended up with the GSK site. When you say need improvement on road access, what does that consist of that improvement? What does that normally consist of? Given that? Of the need improvement? Correct. Um, so we, the, uh, one of the sites we looked at was the Pierce's Road site. Um, we actually did a preliminary site plan of that site, but Pierce's Road already has traffic issues related to um, transversion between Arundel and Pierce's Road. So that, that road would have to be approved considerably to accommodate a fire station and the ability to come out of that site and get in the middle of the whole sheets traffic intersection. So th there's roads there, but improvements would have to be done. Um, as compared to the, the site that we're talking about, um, there's a site beside the East Regional Center we looked at, um, but there's not even a road that even goes to it. So we'd have to build a road. From what we were told before, if the site is located on Judd Street at the GSK property, there's still going to have to be significant work done to the road and to that intersection. Yeah, and I don't know if either Joe or Mike one can speak better to improvements that would be necessary on Judd Street. I, I do know one improvement that we identified from a fire service perspective was um, light, a stoplight control at Judd and Arundel. Um, that's for a couple of different reasons. One, to get get on to a rental without sitting in the traffic waiting to get through. Plus, that's a huge benefit to the residents. Fire truck isn't just sitting at the intersection blowing horns and sirens. They they pass right on through the intersection and go. Um, we got that feedback from one of our partner, one of the towns we talked to. They said, don't let fire trucks sit at intersections in a residential. Get them on through there so they're not just sitting there trying to get out and causing a lot of ruckus. So that's that was to your point. Um, that's that would be an improvement that would that we saw was needed. And because that's an NCDOT road, there will of course have to be that whole process and the quarter of a million dollar minimum price tag to put the traffic signal up. Correct. Uh, I'd have to rely on somebody else. Joe's giving us a thumbs up. Okay. And remind me again what our average number of calls are per day, fire and EMS. In other words, how many times during the day would that intersection be shut down momentarily? Yeah, so your, um, ours, I can tell you, is it's about 2,000 calls a year. 
is where we were at. We'll be well north of that this year. EMS is going to be higher than that. EMS runs more call. I don't, I don't know what their current call volume is, but it's higher than ours. I'm, I'm just thinking in terms of how bad a rental may get backed up yeah. just because of the number of calls. And, you know, granted it's 30 seconds right. and you're through the intersection, but it's right. everything stopped. Yeah, I could. Um, and of course, you know, it's, it's, it's an average because some days you'll go and it'll, it'll go. But, yeah, I could see that happening um, eight to ten times a day easy. Easy. During a 24-hour period. More questions? No, I'm fine. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. We're going to need a little bit of direction from the board on the fire station. So our intent, while you don't have to act on this, our intent is to bring back a memorandum of understanding at your March regular meeting. And what we could do is based upon the feedback that are the questions that you've asked tonight, we can come back to that March meeting with answers to those questions. And if, it, if it's satisfactory, then you can move on the memorandum of understanding. If it's not satisfactory, then don't act on it and just we'll do additional research. But I think, and I'm just speaking at the staff level, we need to demonstrate to our potential partners, specifically Wake County EMS, that we are like processing through this. Because as you could tell from Chris's slide, we've been methodically working through this for several years. So. If, if I, I got to know that you all are okay with us bringing back a memorandum of understanding and being prepared to answer the questions, just knowing that if, if the answers don't satisfy you, you don't have to adopt it. But are you all going to be okay with that, at least by a show of hands, or don't do that? We can't act on it without answers to some of our questions, so. Right. And I personally would like to see a plan B. I mean, there's another option. We, don't see, we seem to only have one way to go. That's GSK. It seems like it's pushing us that way. I'd like to see a plan B. That's me personally. Okay. So you need, you need some more information. Okay. All right. I recognize Michael Clark. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the board. Um, this presentation is probably going to be a little bit better, or not better, but different than the others uh, tonight um, in terms that we're, our department's offering uh, something very unique for the town of Zedlin. Um, as you're aware, when it comes to land development, um, there's tools that the town uses to better evaluate um, as well as uh, work with the development community to create the best possible outcome for the town. At one point, unfortunately, our toolbox looked a bit like this. It was very limited in the resources, and as the saying goes, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, so there was certain tools such as the special use district that was used pretty extensively for the residential development. Um, as time went on, our toolbox changed from this to this. Um, with the adoption of our land use plan, the transportation plan, and more significantly, the largest component of it, our unified development ordinance, it created several new tools, new options that, now, that were not in place previously, um, such as conditional zoning, um, plan development, as well as increased regulations as they uh, pertain to open space, reforestation, as well as design guidelines. Tonight, I'm bringing before you an entirely new tool uh, known as a water or utility allocation policy. Um, this tool will work in conjunction with the others. A utility allocation policy is um, a method to work with the development community 
um, to create options if they want to connect into the uh, municipal uh, water and sewer system. It creates a buffet list of options where there's a points category um, that they will have to achieve. There's maximum points that are available per category, and the base points are going to be dependent upon the use that um, they're provide, or proposing. The reason, one of the reasons we want to do this is we do have a finite amount of water and sewer available. Um, as you can see here, our development uh, projections um, don't exceed our future water allocation. However, we do want to protect this to the best of our capabilities and make sure that the development that's coming in is of high quality. Um, at one point in history, Zevelin did not have much of a residential base, and that's shifting. Let's make sure that we start diversifying the opportunities for housing, and this is one mechanism to be able to do so. So the policy as uh, the draft is structured would create base points. Um, these would be specific for uses as they are submitted before the, uh, uh, by the applicant. The town would look at those um, and determine, okay, which category does it fit in? Uses that are gonna be more um, uh, desirable, such as mixed use development, obviously would have a higher base points, which would mean they would have to achieve less additional bonus points. The bonus points is the buffet option. Um, it's broken into four categories, and each category has a maximum allotment of points that can be uh, um, achieved. So you would not be able to just come in and achieve all your points from one category. The reason for this is it spreads it out and creates um, a much uh, broader option of um, development that the developer can pick from, as well as expand out the options for the town to achieve uh, greater development than what would otherwise be required under the strict interpretation of the ordinance. But it does need to be beyond what the ordinance currently allows. Um, if a greenway, as an example, is required based on our transportation plan or a greenway plan, they have to put that in. If they want points for a greenway, they'll have to do additional greenway legs and connections into it to achieve those points. Um, all of the developments will need to make or achieve a minimum of 50 points. And the matrix would look something like this. Um, the use, the maximum uh, points that they'd be able to achieve would be 40. And the reason we did this is there's enough incremental items that the additional 10 points should not be very difficult to achieve for, let's say, a mixed-use development. Um, whereas we want to set residential developments at a, a different category. Uh, we want to obviously correct non-conforming situations um, and expand our public infrastructure when it goes beyond what would be otherwise required under the strict interpretation. Um, Senate Bill 25 limited the design uh, capabilities of the town where we can no, re no longer require a residential design, um, architectural design conditions at site plan, but we can in other areas such as conditional zoning, plan development, and we've been able to successfully do so. However, not everything is going to need to go through that process. So that's one of the reasons that we included that um, in addition to green development or standards, which we only have one planet. Let's be good stewards of what we have. Um, outdoor enhancement is really going into the quality of life features. Um, it's also one of the most recognizable elements of most communities and developments. Uh, and obviously, additional elements really serve the residents, um, but they don't necessarily have to be limited to that. Total, they would have to achieve those 50 points. So the base point for target uses, like I mentioned, great example is a mixed-use development. Um, so 90% of the points that would need to be achieved could be um, just based on the use. Whereas some of the desired uses, and granted, a two-story Chick-fil-A in town would be awesome, um, but they would still have to make up some of the points. Finally, the less desired uses, specifically things that we have an overabundance of at this moment in time, would be something like a single family detached residential neighborhood. Right now, we have over 3,000 residential lots that have vested rights that have yet to begin construction. That translates to over 8,000 additional residents. That's assuming we don't approve another lot for the next seven years. That's the t uh, time frame it's gonna take to build out all those neighborhoods. We have two other neighborhoods that are currently in some level of review, one of which um, will likely be coming before you sometime later this spring. 
The other is a conservation subdivision, which they're able to meet the requirements of the UDO without having to do a rezoning. The bonus points categories, as I mentioned, uh, go into non-conforming public and public infrastructure, green design and development standards, um, outdoor enhancement, as well as the additional amenities um, that, of course, would be above and beyond what would be required in the ordinance. The way this works is a developer would submit a matrix similar to this where they'll have to actually pick through the buffet options and tell us which of the um, items they're going to provide and illustrate that's above and beyond the requirements of the ordinance. We'll go through, verify, um, and as you can see, there's different point categories based on the intensity and activity necessary to achieve those. So let's go into a couple examples. Um, right now, we don't have much in the way of mixed-use development. Um, but if we did, it could have a green roof, um, meeting space that would be open to the public, not just for the occupants of that particular building. Um, additionally, a rooftop garden. These components combined would give them a total point score of 56, and they would only need 50. Um, five of those would come from the green development standards, specifically the rooftop deck, and then the additional amenities of the public meeting space as well as the deck would accommodate that 11 points. But let's start looking at examples of things that might get developed um, that you're aware of. The Wedgwood Shopping Center is an example. At some point, this is going to need to be uh, redeveloped based on the progression of land value as well as the limitations on how long these buildings can be repaired and patched um, before they require full redevelopment. In this set case, let's say the developer came in with a two-story building, good architectural design, and pulled it close to um, Gannon Road. So in this case, uh, in this example, um, imagine this as Gannon Road and then the parking's around back. Um, it's also uh, in close location to where we already have um, a bus station, but it's in a hidden location. Let's say they allocate um, space, and not only allocate the space, but construct um, the bus stop. Uh, and additionally, they bring in some public art. Um, it doesn't have to be complex, but something like the mural uh, in downtown could be replicated. In that situation, that would give them 54 out of 50 points. Um, they would start with 38 base points, so they would have to make up the other 12. Um, 10 of which they'd be able to achieve from the design and green standards, um, and then the outdoor enhancement uh, would be the six. Another opportunity, and probably the one that's going to be most applicable for this new tool, would be our residential developments. Um, Autumn Lakes is a subdivision that came in several years ago. Um, it was proven under a different set of regulations, so a lot of what you see out there now would not have been able to be developed. However, Let's take a look at the context of what could be required or could be offered. Um, first of all, additional green space um, uh, through the greenway system, additional connectivity into our system as well as throughout the neighborhood. Um, architectural design standards um, above and beyond what they have right now. That could be an option. Pocket parks, additional amenity features located within the development as well as enhanced landscaping um, in the public right-of-ways, uh, specifically in and around um, the, the entry signs. This is a bit of a different scenario because they start with only 15 uh, base points, so they have to make up the remainder of that through the bonus points. In this example, with those amenity or those features added into, into it, um, it would be an additional six points uh, for non-conformities and public infrastructure, um, 10 points for the design standards for the residential home, um, uh, architectural standards, uh, 10 points uh, outdoor enhancement um, with the additional landscaping, and then a little pocket park um, possibility, that'd be uh, an additional 12 points. Um, so all of these adding up would give them the 53 out of the minimum 50 required. The goals of this is to really raise the bar on development. Um, like I said, we have 3,000 residential dwelling units that are going to be constructed in the next seven years, independent of anything we approve. Most of those are approximately the same price point. It's time to start thinking beyond um, the entry level because there's a demand right now for higher level housing within the community. This is one tool that helps us to achieve that. Um, incentify uh, target developments. 
um, infill development in close proximity to downtown, uh, mixed-use development, um, commercial operations, restaurants. These are all things that this, uh, this policy helps to incentivize because they start with a higher base points compared to the residential developments. Um, we have a finite amount of water and sewer. Let's start leveraging that, much like a good pipe wrench that creates leverage to be able to get that pipe to move. We can utilize the same opportunities with our utility or with our uh, public utilities. Um, let's also shift some of the burden. Earlier mentioned about uh, um, with all the different departments about additional features. We could start shifting the burden for land uh, uh, being provided for future fire stations, parks, um, greenways, all above and beyond what would otherwise be required in our unified development areas. Additionally, it also can shift the burden when it comes to the transportation, such as road improvements um, that would be necessary. In return, they would be able to get allocated points towards their water allocation policy. Finally, and probably the most important, is it really creates a focus on the quality of life. All of these components really go into making sure that it's a really high quality of life for our residents as they move into these new neighborhoods and experience the new residential and commercial opportunities. So moving forward, the next steps, um, if you're comfortable with this, is we would schedule for a joint public hearing in March. Um, it would be before uh, this board as well as the planning board because it does require an amendment to the unified development ordinance. Um, that amendment is actually a very small amendment and the policy itself would be a separate policy which would be able to be amended and modified as time progresses and our needs change without having to go back and amend the unified development ordinance. Um, depending upon uh, the actions, questions and uh, experience at the joint public hearing, possibility of adoption in April. Um, and with that, I'm available if you have any questions. I don't feel comfortable with this yet, okay. and I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to need to see the proposed base usage points for everything. Mm -hmm. So I know that you were just speaking really high level, trying to give us an understanding of what this is, but I feel like we have already heard this before. This isn't new. Well, it might be for Commissioner Miles, but it's not new to the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And while I support what this does for enhancing our toolbox and our ability to control what kind of development we're allowing to happen within our borders. Mm -hmm. I really, I want to see what the planning department has in mind for how these points are going to be allocated. Absolutely. Do you have any type of a little sheet developed so we understand how many points you get for five extra trees and ten extra shrubs and... Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Is there some kind of comparison with other municipalities as far as... I guess I don't want us to be, become so restrictive in our incentives that we uh, discourage developers. Yeah, actually, a lot of this um, is comparable to uh, the water, well, water or utility allocation policies in both Wendell, Nightdale, and the town of Clayton. Um, all of these have a similar threshold. Um, each one is modified slightly based on the needs expressed in the comprehensive land use plan and their strategic plans. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mayor, members of the board. Um, tonight's uh, presentation is going to break it into two parts. 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the stadium, uh, the minor league baseball standards, and then we're going to turn it over to our, our, our attorney to talk about the legal pieces of it. Um, take you back a few years, I guess when we in the town of Zubin got into the baseball business in 1991, there was a set of standards that basically drove the structure that was originally constructed out there by the town and Mr. Bryant. Then move forward a little bit in 1997 when we got funding from Wake County and the city of Raleigh, we basically built a stadium that met um, Division Three basically baseball standards. Even though the Mudcats were a Division Two one, we built stadium to meet Division Three standards, and basically we focused on seating capacity, light levels, uh, batting cages, and square footages for various home teams and visitor team clubhouse. Well, move forward and in 2020, there was a reduction of 120 teams in minor league baseball. And like, just like Mike was talking about the involvement of the UDO, now water uh, allocation policy, major league baseball team has evolved again its standards. And one of the things that the county and the town are looking at right now is how these new standards are going to affect our facility. And I, tonight, my goal is just to give you a, a brief look into some of those things that they're looking at with the idea that a comprehensive report is coming back to you probably in April work session to show you where the analysis are, where we stand, what needs to be improved, and stuff like that. So I'm going to give you a brief one analysis of that. There's approximately 15 to 20 pages of standards that are met, need to be met. Uh, and some of them we meet, some of them we don't. Some things need to be added to or not. Some low-hanging fruit that will have to be made through these new major league uh, development standards for uh, maybe be as they considered a companion post for security. The other ones are showers for females. Back in 97, when the superstructure was built and stuff, those type of women were not involved in baseball like they are now. So now we have to make uh, combinations to have women showers. Um, the Visitor Team Clubhouse, another low laying fruit would be additional whirlpool. There's a number of whirlpools that are required for the number of players. Um, let's see here. An enclosed batting cage. There's a batting cage on site now, so it, it needs to be enclosed. Again, low hanging fruit. Where this process gets expensive and complicated is, is the other items. Uh, the field replacement. Uh, 2013, there was a major field grading uh, operation that went on, they changed the grade of the field, put under drainage and stuff. Well, it's, it's lived, outlived its useful life. Basically this year at 10 years, it, the useful life of the, that is complete. One of the other things is baseball lighting standards have changed. Back in, in uh, 97 when we built that, the standard was 100, um, excuse me, 60 cubic uh, foot candles per foot for the infield and approximately uh, 70 for the outfield. Well, the new ones are going to be 100 for the in interior, uh, for the infield. So the lighting standards have changed. We're going to have to look to upgrade the lighting out at that facility. And at that time, we're also going to look at the possibility of using LED as technology has changed and the availability of the throw the light in, in a longer distance than in the past. There's uh, square foot requirements for visitor square, uh, visitor uh, clubhouse. A couple of examples, there's a need for another 170 750 square feet for players areas, 175 feet for training room, coaches areas need to be increased. Um, so there's just a few items that are that require expansion. And anytime you do an expansion to a facility, it's not just the building the square footage, it's, it's, it's the HVAC, it's the electrical, it's the roofing, uh, it's the plumbing, and then the capacity of the infrastructure feeding those things. So, that is what the county is now working through its consulting to get that their arms wrapped around this analysis and the goal of bringing that data back to both boards and so thus they can help make better decisions long term where this facility goes and where it needs to be brought up to meet major league baseball standards. So hopefully I didn't bore you too much with a little history lesson and um, but I did want to just give you a blink, uh, a, a, glance in, a glance, glance into, excuse me, into some of the things that the county is looking at through their uh, assessment at this time. Be glad to answer any questions. So, what kind of, what kind of financial contribution is the town going to be expected to make? Is it going to be um, comparable to 
the ownership that we currently retain? That's all to be determined in the report and through the negotiations with us, the county, and the brewer. So that is one of the things we need to get the report back, seeing what the, the shortfall is, and then uh, we can go to work on what the brewer's responsibilities will be, what the, uh, the town and the county's responsibilities, and then we can come back and find a look at what the town and county's contributions are. So the report is the first step uh, to figure out what needs to be done, how much it's going to be, and then we can come fine tune who's responsible for each party, whether it's the brewers, the town, or the county. Okay. Thank you. Was there any mention about the um, disability upgrades for yes, disabilities? Yes, definitely, definitely. Prior uh, to code, we started a ADA ass uh, accessibility project out there by adding additional bathrooms uh, and access out there. Uh, that is a part of the assessment that will be included. Yes, sir. Yeah, I understand there's a meeting with Wake County on Monday the 21st. Two other items I'd like to have addressed or discussed. As I understand, the agreement now says the town can only use that facility five times a year. As long as we're doing a lease amendment, possibly that could be increased. And then also, since it's, it sets empty 300 nights a year, what can we do to get something out there so we're using the asset? Yes, sir. I think that's all the part of the things that we'll need to look at after the report is complete and we're going into and revising a new lease agreement. Clearly, any investment that, that the town puts in, Wake County puts in, the brewer puts in, everybody's going to want a new long-term contract. That's the time we bring everybody to the table and negotiate a, you know, what, what new things that we need, what things the brewers need and stuff. So I would recommend waiting to till the assessment is complete and, and when we do that new contract that, you know, we're going to talk about spending millions of dollars on both sides potentially, there's going to need to be a long-term contract for somebody who makes that investment. I'm just foreshadowing a little, but that sounds reasonable to me. Great. If somebody makes that kind of commitment, we're going to need something more than a five-year term. Thank you. Any other questions before I turn it over to our attorney? Thank you, guys. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm going to address six issues related to Five County Stadium. The first is the existing uh, lease. The second is going to be the Mudcats' desire to extend the lease. Uh, the third will be the brief description of the Major League Baseball uh, Facilities Improvement Initiative, uh, cost of compliance, and then the, um, the specific topic that's up for consideration, the Second Amendment, and finally, next steps. The existing lease expires on December 31st, 2022. There are two five-year extensions. Uh, the extensions are exercised by providing advance notice. For the first five-year extension, the notice has to be granted before September 1st, 2022nd. It also provides the cost-sharing structure between the landlord and the tenant. As you know, Wake County and Zebulon are the landlord together, and the Mudcats are the tenant. The Mudcats desire to extend the lease. What is their motivation? Well, they want to lock in a lease through at least the 2023 season. So they're going to operate 2022, and they want to lock in to 2023. The current extension option is for five years. So at the same time that they want to be able to lock in for at least two years, they want to create the option to terminate by December 31st, 2023. So why are they trying to accelerate this extension? They've got until September, 20, September 1st, 2022 to notify us that they want to extend. Well, the primary motivation is this Major League Baseball Facilities Improvement Initiative. And as Chris described it, there's a restructure of minor league baseball. There's been a reduction in the number of licenses that the, minor, that the major leagues approve for minor league teams. And the major league baseball wants to establish higher and consistent standards all across the minor league. And it's particularly related to ballparks and the facilities that serve the ballparks. 
there is a compliance calendar in place that goes from 2021 through 2025. There is a requirement in the compliance structure that requires substantial compliance with the improvements and the uh, facilities improvements by December 21st, December 31st, 2023. So here you have the Mudcats that are saying, we'd like to get our uh, schedule more quickly. We'd like to go ahead and extend right now because the planning horizon for compliance by December 31st, 2023 is upon us right now. So even if we get extended, even if they commit to operate through 2023, they're gonna have to start planning, designing, entering into contracts and figure out funding immediately in order to meet that December 31st, 2023 compliance deadline. Now, you don't have to have 100% of it done by December 31st, 2023, but you gotta have an awful lot of it done by then. And then it gets more strict with less leeway in 2024. It gets even more strict with less leeway in 2025. And at the end of 2025, according to Major League Baseball, there can be no non-compliance whatsoever. So that accounts for the urgency, and that's why the Mudcats are trying to get this extension right now. Uh, the fourth topic was the cost of compliance. The county and the Mudcats are each currently conducting a cost study Chris explained that, so I won't go into that any further. And that brings us to the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment does four things. It exercises the extension right now. It adds a termination option effective December 31st, 2023. It enters into a definitive compliance agreement by September 1st, 2022. Commissioner Lux, you were asking about the new agreement, and Chris was expanding on how there would be a new agreement once the investment parameters are set up. Well, that, according to the Second Amendment, needs to be entered into by September 1st, 2022. Frankly, I think that a short deadline like that to get it done is a good thing. But do I think that there's possibility that it might get kicked down the, uh, the road a little bit? Yeah, I think it might. So the fourth item is and probably uh, the most important is a commitment by the Mudcats to operate in 2022 or 2023. Uh, just because they've extended the lease, just because they have a right to do it, they could hold on and pay their rent but still not operate a team. And that would not help either Zebulon or Wake County. So they have committed during those two years there to operate in 2022 and 2023. So the last item is next steps. Um, Wake County uh, commissioners take this up um, on February 21st. It is in fact, uh, they will consider whether to approve the lease extension. And then for this board, we're presenting this to you to um, get your wishes on how you wish to go forward on this. So that's, uh, that's the report. If you have any questions, glad to answer. Um, I know right now uh, Major League Baseball is uh, experiencing, I guess, um, spring training holdout. Will that affect the operation of our affiliates here? If there is a if there's a walkout this year for Major League Baseball. Um, we heard from one of the Mudcat representatives that minor league baseball was going to take place regardless of the major league walkout, lockout, negotiation impasse. Let me just double check and confirm that with Chris. I believe that's what they said in that. Yes, sir, that's correct. So minor league baseball is going on business as usual. Thank you. Thank you. Bond referendum. Uh, 
Good evening. Um, you'll recall back at the December work session, we, we came to you with a little bit of information regarding a possible bond referendum that could be uh, coming up on the November ballot, November of 2022 this year. Um, Y'all are needing, uh, want some additional information uh, about some of the items that the bond council would do. I believe we gave some fees and stuff last time. Uh, but you want some more detail on what uh, they did. So we'll, we'll go through that tonight, uh, as well as the financial advisor, uh, talk about what they would do for us, uh, public information and engagement piece, and then some of the uh, state law uh, recent changes. Just stop me as we, as we go along through uh, these items. Uh, one of the biggest things the bond council does is provide an opinion letter to the town for the uh, bond issue for bond buyers. Uh, this is a requirement that's done. Uh, helps with interest, uh, getting tax exempt interest, and uh, uh, better rates and uh, lower interest rates. Uh, they structure these finance and covenants for us. Uh, prepare bond orders and notice the public hearings. Um, assist with sworn statement of debt and drafting the bond orders with publication uh, for them and the ballot uh, questions that go on the uh, ballot. They monitor LGC approval of our application, assist with our application, um, publish official notices of uh, referendum, stating the date and amount of the bonds, uh, things of that nature. Uh, they verify the tax exempt status of the bonds, uh, discussions with the town, LGC, and work with the financial advisors uh, regarding the plan of finance, uh, regarding state and federal law, uh, bond bid documents, and the financing schedule. Uh, as far as the advice and counsel they provide, uh, they draft numerous documents to explain the process related to the referendum uh, regarding the validity of the bonds and the tax exempt uh, issuance and how it works. These are all uh, key items, some of the most important things they would do. As far as the costs go, I think we told you a little bit about this uh, in December. The referendum portion, uh, the work they do leading up to that, uh, would be about $8,400. Uh, that's what it would be, let's say, if the, the referendum doesn't pass and so we don't have to do any bond issuance. Um, if it does pass, their work with the bond issuance would be another uh, about $27,500. A uh, little bit about what the financial advisor uh, does. They kind of do in... Uh, two phases, uh, beginning phase, uh, kind of some pre-planning work. They kind of uh, do a in-depth financial profile of the town uh, and the general fund to uh, uh, provide a basis of which a capital funding plan can be, uh, be developed. Um, <clears throat> looking at the fund balance position over the last five years to develop uh, cash flow uh, trends. Um, they would provide, a, like if we need additional capital funding, uh, whether that be like pay-as-you-go financing or uh, non-geo debt like for vehicles and things like that where you don't have to go uh, for a general obligation bond, you just do a installment financing. Uh, and this funding plan will serve as like a roadmap for uh, future capital funding activities. And it's very useful for the LGC and the rating agency discussions uh, throughout the, the bond issuance process. They would also develop a peer comparison to other towns of our size. Um, so see how we stack up against uh, similar units. Uh, develop a debt capacity analysis. You know, they'd say, okay, here's your tax base. This is the amount of debt you could uh, handle. Um, those phase one fees, it's based on an hourly rate, really, uh, but it's not to exceed uh, 10000 Then 
then as far as uh, what, if the referendum passes, it comes time to sell the bonds, uh, they, they assist with the bond issuance, whether it be through a uh, direct bank financing or through a public uh, bond issue. Um, they would handle all the legwork for the RFE for the bank uh, loan issuance or the public issuance. They would, they would go to the uh, bond rating agencies and basically uh, on our behalf and just uh, explain our, um, our profile, uh, basic campaign for us and uh, try to do the best for us as far as lower interest rates and terms and things like that. Um, they would also do all the leg work as far as the paperwork goes, as far as uh, bond issuance. Uh, those fees, it varies greatly. Uh, if it's a direct loan, uh, direct bank loan, it could be anywhere from thirty to 45000 depending on the uh, size of the bond issuance that we would do, whether that be five, ten, fifteen million, whatever, uh, the fee would kind of vary. And then for uh, public sale in the bond market, uh, it would be fifty to seventy thousand, roughly. That's how much it would cost for them to manage that sale. Right. All right. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about uh, at the December meeting, you got a sample ballot from, uh, there was a handful of municipalities in Wake County that did a bond referendum this past year. Um, you saw a, a couple sample ballots that I gave. A um, couple of them did uh, some, ex some public engagement pieces, which is a good, uh, helpful thing to do. Uh, you remember I mentioned last time we can educate and inform the public on this, this referendum but we can't promote or campaign uh, for it necessarily. Um, so you're gonna see a couple examples of some local municipalities, Garner and Fuquay. Uh, these are some little videos that they uh, put together uh, to kind of educate the public on what, what they wanted to do. <coughs> so we're gonna show that real quick.
A big part of Garner's charm lies in its older established neighborhoods. But some of these neighborhoods have aging stormwater infrastructure that has not been updated in decades. The stormwater bonds, totaling up to $2,950,000, will be used to upgrade old and aging storm drain infrastructure to ensure proper drainage of town streets. If voters approve the bond budget for all four of these categories, the town anticipates an estimated property tax increase of two cents per $100 assessed property value to finance the bond. General obligation bonds are the town's most fiscally responsible option for financing large capital products. Garner has earned extremely strong bond ratings from S&P and Moody's, and this would enable the town to secure low interest rates for the bond. Early voting for the November municipal election that includes the bond referendum begins October 23rd, and the election day is November 7th. Garner's future is bright, and our community will see new economic, recreational, and cultural opportunities through wise planning and investment. Help shape Garner's future by making your voice heard in the upcoming bond referendum. To learn more about the 2021 bond referendum, visit GarnerBonds.com. All right, now here's uh, one for Fuquay Verena. It's only about a minute long, so I'm not wrong. Fuquay Verena has become one of the fastest growing and most desirable places to live. The town is working diligently to preserve its charm and sense of community while embracing change. Our AAA bond rating helps secure lower interest rates for voter approved general allocation bonds. We wish to advance quality of life projects at the lowest possible cost. So the town board decided unanimously to ask voters to vote on the 2021 Transportation and Parks and Recreation Bonds. The 2021 Transportation Bond will total up to $20 million. This includes improvements to intersections, building new roads, bicycle and pedestrian projects, traffic mitigation safety, and more. The 2021 Parks and Recreation Bond will total $18.5 million. This includes construction of a facility offering programs and amenities for all ages plus a dedicated space to accommodate active adults 55 and over. Make sure to vote November 7th. Uh, you, can, uh, you can kind of do what you want in these uh, videos you want to create. Uh, Fuquay did theirs in-house. Um, they kind of did, they have a, uh, I think, communications department that basically created this, this video here. I'm not sure who did Garner's yet. I uh, hadn't heard back from them about uh, who they did it with or if they did it themselves. Um, I think we spoke last time. AECOM has kind of worked with uh, Parks and Rec Master Plan uh, and some of that stuff. They, they are the ones that I mentioned last time. Um, they can do similar uh, work for about 50000 uh, for their uh, campaign, or if you want to call it campaign or education campaign. Um, so we can kind of do as, as much or little as you want to do as far as cost. Uh, we may or may not have staff to put together something like that necessarily, but um, we could do something uh, if, it, if it came to that. Um, any questions on that or those videos or, or the education piece? Could we bid that out? Could we bid that out? What was your question? Could we bid that oh, bid out? bid it out. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, one thing I didn't mention, I uh, mentioned at the beginning, the Senate Bill 265 uh, was adopted last May. Uh, just a little bit about it. It's the bond transparency. Um, it's called the Bond Information Transparency Act. Um, this basically just requires that uh, a statement of disclosure, disclosure be filed with the LGC, posted online, and maintained by the uh, clerk of the board. What you have to publish is basically the interest, uh, estimated amount of interest you'd be repaying, uh, the property tax that's uh, proposed to pay for the debt. Let's say you're going to propose a 4% tax increase to pay for the debt service every year. Uh, those are just something that would have to be um, in that statement of disclosure uh, that is public published for the uh, public to see and be aware of, hence the transparency.
so here's a summary of the cost. Um, ballpark figures on the financial advisor, anywhere from 40 to 80,000, uh, depending on if it's a uh, direct bank loan or a public sale. Uh, bond council, roughly about 36,000. And um, the public engagement and education piece, like I said, uh, the AECOM estimate they gave us is about 50,000, but that could vary uh, greatly. Any questions on any of that? So that's $166,000 just to bring it to the ballot. Right. All right, and, and so, oh, go ahead. Um, almost everybody rolls that into the bond issuance. What's, yeah, if it gets approved. Yeah, most of these fees don't, you don't have to pay for these fees until the bonds are issued. So they don't, they don't have to have that up front or anything. Uh, let's say it gets approved, we borrow 10 million. Well, we uh, maybe borrow another 100,000 and roll it into the, the bond issuance and just amortize it over the, the life of the uh, bonds, 20 years or 25 or whatever we were to do. And so how much do we anticipate asking for? Don't know yet. Um, it depends. Maybe. It's kind of hard being sold on a bond referendum when we don't have that kind of information. Yeah. Well, I think in the ballpark of maybe 10 million, possibly. Um, and do we have an idea of what that money will be spent on, what the proposed uses are, and how much for each proposed use? Uh, fire station, about 4 million. Uh, uh, North Arundel, 4. And the parks piece is kind of the one up in the air, the most up in the air. I miss the second Could be anywhere from Arundel, I mean, project. 2 to 6 or... And what about waiting for more clarity about the Mudcat Stadium? Because if we have to make a significant investment in order to keep them in town, and that's what we choose to do, it would make sense to me to try and put that into the bound referendum as well, right? Mm, I guess it's a possibility. I don't know what would the the dollar figure be on that. Ten million. Ten million. Ten million. That's, that's for all parties. That that's for every, that's the the combined. Okay. That's an estimate. That's early. That's that's fine. That's fine. And what's our bond rating right now? Uh, double A three. Moody's. Double A three. And so, what would that mean for our interest rate? Uh, it would be pretty good. I mean, I, I can't give you a number. Okay, um, I, I don't I, have any way to to understand what pretty good is. It wouldn't be as good as a triple A, probably for like what Raleigh would get, but it's, it would be pretty good for a town our size. All right. I mean, we would we would get better than let's say. I don't want to pick on anybody. They but, don't. That's fine. Yeah. But pretty good for a town so. Okay. Thank you. But that's a question. Yeah, good information. One, just one quick question. So if the bond didn't pass, what would be our option then? Just mm -hmm. kind of curious. Uh, we'd have to go to plan B. We and don't have would... a plan B right now. Okay. Sounds <laughs> okay. okay. uh, okay. good. Well, uh, you know, it might get kick further down the road. Uh, we could go other avenues for the fire station. Um, if, if It just depends on priorities of the board as far as when, do, when you want to do it, how important is it, and then it would be like, how do you pay for it? If you don't do a bond, a geo bond issue, you could do other ways. Um, but this would be the most affordable way, typically, as far as interest rates go, um, things like that. Yeah, Bobby, any idea of a timeline on when we would have to initiate this to get on a November ballot? Yeah, we need to kind of start here in the next probably month or so to make a determination if we do we want to proceed or not, if we want to go on November. Yeah. 
the, the calendar that was provided to us, they says prior to April 15th um, to make kind of a go or no go decision. Because at the May meeting, we have to start uh, doing some resolutions as far as preliminary findings uh, relating to the beginning authorization of bonds. Any other questions? No more questions? Thank you. Okay, final comment before I close out staff reports. Really the, the question that's before the board on the bond referendum is how much of a priority do you place on being on the November ballot? That's really what it is. You don't have to get on the November ballot. You can do it later in the year. You can actually um, kick it to the following November. Um, it doesn't have to be this November. Um, and Commissioner Baxter has raised up some good points. You all have not had a discussion on what you want to fund and, and, and price tags. So we're just trying to get you educated so you're not at the 11th hour. But if you do want to make November 2022 it's starting to get compressed so that's really what that's really what kind of direction we're going to need from y'all if y'all want to move on that ballot date we're going to have to move so that's it um i'll take any final questions or comments but other than that that completes our presentation for the evening i guess we have a better understanding once uh, the county as far as the mudcats are concerned just how much they're going to fund and how much we need to fund. That's I, I certainly think so on the, um, on, as it relates to five County stadium, I think another thing that will bring you clarity is your April mini retreat is going to be a strategic planning retreat. And that's going to offer you a time for you to assemble as a group and prioritize what's most important to you. Um, obviously you will miss the, I mean, be, very tight, but I'm, I would say that you would miss the November ballot date by doing that. But anyway, I think you know, you'll you'll know more uh, in the next two months on both what Wake County will or may not do on Five County Stadium, as well as know what you have an interest in as it relates to fire stations, parks, roadways. Any more questions, comments? What's the price tag on getting all of our stormwater infrastructure updated? Um, I don't want to say something publicly because you hold on to it. We got a very preliminary report. I want to say the price tag was four point six million. Yeah. Yeah, and that was that was looking at the just the core area of town. When I say core area, I'm talking about an area roughly bounded by Wakefield to Judd to Shepherd School down to Barbie Street. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, staff, for your reports, You've given us a lot of information that we're going to have to uh, make some decisions about uh, in the future and um, get back with you. Get back with us on some of those uh, questions that were were asked, and maybe we can decide once we get that information. There are no more questions. Maybe uh, provide a quick update on the meeting next Monday night with the mayors as regarding the mask. 
with all the questions that have been flying around? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm meeting with the mayors on Monday. Um, that's, that's in the agreement, Wake County mayors. Um, of course, we just heard today that the, the governor is uh, recommending um, no mandates on the mask. So, well, we'll see. We'll see what what comes out of that meeting and give you some information. Um, I'm also probably going to the uh, Wake County Board of Commissioners meeting, which is also Monday. And um, if there's any information about the stadium, I'll re refer that back. Any other questions, comments? I move to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. Second. Yep. Second. Second. All in favor? Meeting adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>